Well, if you have your Bibles, if you open them, the whole Bible's good, but this morning we're going to Genesis chapter number 22. Genesis 22, I am so glad to be back at First Baptist Church. I had a tremendous time with Brother Summers and Carrie and uh, Patty and Ella and Lily and McKay. And I tell you what, those two little girls, Lily and McKay, they're just spark plugs and they're just full of energy and life and love. They love seeing the ministry there. I'll share some more of those things tonight. I love spending the time with Brother Bays. One of our deacons was able to go with me. And Brother Rodney Rupel was there as well. And uh, with that combination of men and personalities, it's a surprise we didn't end up in jail. But we didn't. I was touched by some things I'll share tonight and touched by the generosity of the Ghanaians, touched by the culture, touched by what John and Patty are doing. There was just a great, a great uh, time that I had. I was praying for some things, like I said, I'll share tonight. Um, but I was struck by a couple things this morning as we're in the middle of stewardship month. Again, we see it on our side walls, his blessing, my obedience. Uh, we once again, I, I want to this morning uh, talk about that principle of biblical stewardship. Okay, well, I break it down. We're going to talk about money. You're like, oh, great, come on, Pastor, not about money. It must be the church is really in a whole heap of trouble if Pastor preaches on money for a whole month. But see, that's not the point of Stewardship Month, is it now? The Lord will sustain His work. All right, you can't stop. I can't stop God's work from going forward. This principle that I think we find in this chapter here of Genesis chapter 22 is not so much for the church as it is for you and for me as a Christian and as a child of God. I don't wish this, but uh, in Ghana, I was surprised by the amount of churches that were quite physically everywhere. There are more churches, I would say, there, at least in the city of Kamasi, of two, two plus million people, than there are here in Saginaw. In one section where Brother John is ministering in a Kasi school, it's a school, around that, what, about a block and a half, Brother Bays, I think there were six churches, large buildings. You see, in, in Ghana, many of the, the preachers preach a, a, what's called a prosperity gospel. That if you give me money, I'll pray for you and you'll be blessed. And they believe it and do it. I heard of uh, uh, Miss Patty was telling me one story about one of her church ladies had come and, and uh, a pastor that she had known, this lady had known, had said, you need to buy these special blessed sandals. And if you were to buy these sandals, then your life would be blessed, as would, I'm sure, the preacher and his wife's life as well. And this, the, this lady, this church member of, of the, the Summers, was wise enough to know, I think maybe these people just bought too many sandals at the market. And in one sense, if we preach prosperity gospel, prosperity gospel, we could focus on that. I'm not doing that. That's not right. It's not biblical. But it raises a whole lot of money. People believe it. There are street preachers all over the place. In fact, um, Brother Bays and I had the privilege of being woken up to one at 5.30 in the morning, right outside our window, within about 30 feet, right, Brother Bays, somewhere in there? And in case we didn't hear him, he had a microphone and a portable speaker as well. I could not understand most of what he was saying, thankfully. I did notice when he switched to speaking in tongues outside my window at 5.30. It takes a lot of grace not to get out of your bed at 5.30 and tell him what you're really thinking. So as we approach this topic again, there is some truths I believe in here that, that for some will say, well, Pastor Howell, I wish you'd leave this alone, and, and I can't because God brings it to us, and I find in this passage, Genesis chapter 22, a special passage, a unique passage. It's the passage of Abraham when God called him to offer up Isaac. What a powerful passage for any parent, any father in this room. Even those of you who may not be a father or a mother can relate to the tremendous request that God is going to make of his servant, Abraham. To, to see the, the, just the, the weight and the gravity of the situation. Someone said this, I have held many things in my hands and I have lost them all. But whatever I have placed in God's hands, that I still possess. You see, the point of stewardship, the point of this month and this focus, emphasis of First Baptist Church, is not so that at First Baptist Church we can have more in our hands. It's so we, as stewards of God's mercy and grace and generosity, can place it back in His hands. And He can take those things and He will multiply and magnify them. You see, one reason I went 
to Ghana was to really see what John and Patty are doing over there. Have you ever heard of missionaries just on like a, a vacation the whole time? It, it seems like everybody thought that, you know, I mean, come on. It happens somewhere, I'm sure, right? Living the good life in the third world country. And I can stand before you and say, listen, the monies that we send to John and Patty Summer. All right, Patty being from our church, we send her more than other missionaries who are not sent from our church. Is money well spent? Money that is invested not for just our cause, but for his cause. It brings us, if you would, to this passage of Genesis chapter 22. Where the Bible says, And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham. We will get to that little phrase right there. Some of you, when you read that, will, will uh, rear up on the inside. You'll say, God doesn't tempt anybody. And we'll talk about that in a minute, all right? So don't get all bent out of shape yet, all right? Uh, stay with me in this, this morning service, all right? Uh, but I want to mention that so when we get back there, you're not surprised. God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. Probably the best response we can have when God calls our name. Here I am. Samuel had the same response, here I am. Right? Here I am. Verse 2, and he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. And Abraham arose up early in the morning and saddled his ass, and took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son, and clave the wood for the burnt offering, and rose up and went unto the place which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went to both of them together. Imagine that was one of the longest walks Abraham ever took. I doubt Abraham wasn't running up the mountain path with the wood, the fire, the knife, and Isaac. Imagine that walk was a little bit difficult for Abraham. But he took it nonetheless. Verse number 7, Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father, and he said, Here am I, thy, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for, burnt, for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. We'll get back to this verse, but a tremendous promise of a verse prophetic. It was a prophecy of a verse. God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. Did he do that? Absolutely. His name is Jesus Christ. A foretelling of what Christ would do for our sins. He'll be the ultimate sacrifice, the only sacrifice that is worthy to take away our sins. All the other sacrifices that the children of Israel had made at the temple of the animals, they were not able Hebrew tells us they were not able, that the blood of bulls and goats were not able to wash away our sins, only the blood of Jesus Christ. And Abraham, he said, God himself will provide a lamb. Verse 9, and it came to the place which God told him of. And Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called upon him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him, for now I know that thou fearest God, seeing that thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah-Jireh. As it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. Lord, I thank you for your word. Thank you for this truth. I pray that you would help us as we listen, as I speak, Lord, to really grab what you want to say to us today. 
that your spirit would have liberty inside this room, Lord, that you would illuminate the truth from your word. Lord, help me to say those things that would be helpful in understanding, but Lord, I can't do it without your spirit. Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. Lord, I ask for your help this morning. Help us to be listeners, to be good listeners in good soil. Would your word not return void? In Jesus' name I ask, amen. We have here a familiar, a familiar account, a familiar story. One that if I, when I talked about this story, most people have heard of this before. Maybe you've seen a, a drawing or rendition or something along this, and there's some paintings out there, there's some drawings out there. But I have often thought that some of the most familiar passages hold some of the greatest truth, and those we sometimes miss because we, quote, know them so well. This morning, I want to look at this passage if, with the Lord's help, and I believe it'll be this week and next week at the stewardship banquet when we finish up this particular passage of Abraham and the offering of Isaac. <clears throat> of course, I want to give you a little background on Abraham before we, we uh, look exactly at the story, because I believe knowing some things about Abraham will help us in understanding what God has asked, because sometimes, does it not seem in the Bible that these characters are larger than life? That Abraham, what a man of God, the father of the Jewish nation. Abraham. I could never be like Abraham. I could never live like Abraham. I could never have the faith that Abraham had. Yet we are called to the same faith. And because of the Holy Spirit, we have access to more things than Abraham. And yet in our minds, he's way up here. And at the, at the judgment seat, you know, Abraham will walk through and just be piled with treasures and we'll get our small coins. And yet because of Jesus Christ, once he has saved us and his spirit lives inside of us, we are heirs to unspeakable riches. And so this morning I want to begin by maybe giving you some background to Abraham to maybe point out that that his beginning was a little more humble than perhaps we realized. He began with a, a name of Abram, which means exalted father. God changed it to Abraham, the father of multitudes. His wife Sarai, princess, and was changed to Sarah. If you would, hold your finger in Genesis, and we're going to turn a few places to see the life of Abraham a little bit. If you would, first of all, turn to Joshua chapter 24. Hold your finger in Genesis 22 or put your Bible marker there, your I Believe God Bible marker, and turn to Joshua chapter 24. We're going to find out, first of all, that Abraham and his religion, his background, he came from a family that worshipped false gods. Abraham was not born into a family that worshipped God. He was born into a family that worshipped false gods. Some of you, by, being, by the nature of being born into a family that already worshiped God, have a step ahead of Abraham. In Joshua chapter 24, verse number 2, Joshua said unto all the people, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers dwelt on the other side of the flood in old time, even Terah, the father of Abraham and the father of Nacor, and they served, or the last two words, other gods. They didn't serve Jehovah. Abraham didn't learn about serving God necessarily from his father and grandfather. He came from a home that, where they served the false gods. And back then in religion, it was, it was extremely important in, in life. In fact, you may remember that uh, when uh, Laban's gods were stolen, okay, they were stolen. He traced that he raced after them because if you were to steal someone's gods, they would lose all blessing in their life. And so all his blessing in life was gone because his false idols, idols and gods were gone. That's the culture that Abraham came through. And yet we in our minds think, well, Abraham from a young man just believed God. Find that Abraham was in an environment where there are false gods. Where there are people that bowed and worshipped false things. Yet, if you turn back to Genesis 22, hold your finger there and, and flip back a few pages to Genesis chapter 12. We find in Joshua, he gives us the background a little bit on, on Abraham's family and the religion there. And in Genesis 22, we have the story of Abraham and Isaac, but in Genesis 12, in Genesis 12, we have the beginning 
of the story of Abraham. In Genesis chapter number 12, it begins with God speaking to Abram. This is our introduction to Abram. In Genesis 12, verses 1 through 3, or 1 through 4, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, and unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Verse 4, So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him. And Lot went with him, and Abram was seventy and five years old when he departed out of Haran. See, somewhere between the time that Abraham was young and the time that God spoke to him, Abraham turned to God Jehovah. So much so that when God spoke to him, he said, I will leave my family. I will leave my country. I will leave these things behind, and I will follow the Lord Jehovah, Yahweh. And even though my family may worship false gods, even though I'm in a land that worships, worships false gods and false deities, I will follow the one who I trust in my faith in, the true one. And we're over there in Ghana. I get to meet many of the church members there. It's a lady in their church, a lady and husband, actually, and her name is Amanda. I believe they met her when she was in the university and now married and, and doing a great thing and, and really being discipled and doing well. She told me her testimony one night, I think it was Thursday night, in the ride to the Wednesday night or the Thursday night service, midweek service. Her father, Amanda's father, is a king of a tribe over there. He comes, she said, to visit every, like, or twice a year. He lives in England, and the king of the tribe comes back to the tribe twice a year. That's what she said. She talked about how she was saved and, and then what happened with her family because the, the very common religion is what they call traditionalism there. The drums and the worshiping of the dead and libations, things like that are all traditionalism. It's what her family was involved in. And I asked her, I said, okay, I said, well, Amanda, when you got saved, what did that mean to your family? You see here, sometimes in America, there's not much result of us getting saved, right? We kind of live in the whatever works for you mentality. And if you want to do that, that's fine. Just don't rain on my parade. And if you want to go to church all the time and want to be one of those crazy little, that's fine. You do that, but, but don't worry about, you know, the rest of us. She said she was not disowned. But at first, her family would have been okay with it if she had just worshiped God, and continued to be a traditionalist, and continued to worship the false teachings and doctrines that they had, and continued to, to, to do these things, participate in these ceremonies that she could not in a good conscience participate in because they're false. And Abraham, I see, takes away and he becomes a monotheist. He becomes a God worshiper. See, Abraham... His religion, his family was not the same, but he stepped out by faith. You don't have to turn there, but there's four places that Abram, before he's called Abraham, begins to recognize the God of the universe. In Genesis 14, verse 22, he says, And Abram said to the king of Sodom, I lift up my eye unto the Lord, the most high God, the possessor of heaven and earth. It's God Elion. It's a name of God. To this day, it's a name of God. And Abram recognized this God as the Most High God. In Genesis chapter 17, when Abram was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the El Shaddai, the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. In Genesis chapter 21, just if you look at if your finger still in chapter 22, in, in chapter 21, in verse 33, and Abraham planted a grove in Beersheba and called there on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God, El Alam, Yahweh. Abraham knew God. He didn't have a Bible, but he knew God. He didn't have a church, but he worshiped God. He never participated in an offering in a building 
but he gave to God. You see, his religion, his belief in God contrasts sharply with the religion of that day. He believed God to be the God of the cosmos, supreme judge of mankind, controller of nature, highly exalted and eternal. And whenever God spoke to him, Abraham immediately obeyed in faith. We don't have any record of Abraham not immediately obeying when God spoke to him. What an example of faith. You see, when we come to Stewardship Month, it's not about me. It's not about the church. It's about God. It's about Him speaking to us. It's about our faith in God and what He's, he's done for us. And I see His religion. I see His relationships. At 75 years old, He leaves His family, and God gives Him a covenant. Somewhere between there and, and 85, God promises him a son. At 86, he marries Hagar and has Ishmael. At 99 years old, he's promised of Isaac. In 100, Isaac is born. From 75 to 100 years, 25 years old, God is making these promises to Abraham and Abram that have not been completely fulfilled yet. My question, how long do you wait for God's promises? Pastor, I prayed three days. I've been reading my Bible for a whole week. I'm praying for my family for two months. How long will you wait for God's promises? I see in Abraham, I see a longevity of his, his waiting and promises. And then we come now to the background of this story. Abraham, he's right around 115 years old. Isaac's about 15 in this story. Abraham's 115. He's now been probably following the Lord, at least in a physical sense, for over 40 years. If we have someone saved here for 40 years, we'd consider them a mature Christian, would we not? Someone who's seen a few things and learned a few lessons, and yet in just two verses before this test by God, Abraham reaffirms his belief and says, I serve the God, the everlasting God, the one, and he builds a grove in Beersheba. And then this morning I see the request to Abraham. Verses 1 and 2 of Genesis chapter 22 where God, where the Bible says God did tempt Abraham. <clears throat> now we know because of James that God does not tempt us with evil. Every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust, and of his own lust, when that's conceived, bringing forth sin, and sin when it's finished, bringing forth death. So it was not a sinful thing, it was not a temptation as we view temptation. If you look at the word, it means that, that God gave him a, a test. Like we do at school. Every week, it seems like. To the students every day, every hour. Where are you at? Yeah, the teachers, when they give a test, they're not trying to trick the students or trying to cause the students to cheat or to fail. They just want to know, where's this student at? Have you been paying attention in class? Have you been following along in class? Have you been sleeping all the time? Or, or what do you know? You find out from those tests a few things. You find out if you're a good teacher or a bad teacher. You find out if people are falling asleep or not. And so God gave Abraham a test. To be honest, we'll look at that test. We're like, that's not the test that I want God to give me. Right? Now, let's just be honest for a moment here as, as humans and as parents and as people. We're like, God, I don't like your test, God. I don't like it. I choose a different test. I think it's a ridiculous test you give me. Not Abraham. Not Abraham. He didn't have those thoughts. The Bible tells us none of that. The Bible says that God came to him and said, Abraham, I'm looking for a personal request. I'll take now thy son. Boy, if that was you or me, say what? I'm sorry, Lord. I thought you said take my son. I must have misheard you. <laughs> but God clarified real quick. Take now thy son, thine only son, Isaac. Yeah, that's what he said. 
Whom thou lovest. In case you missed it the first two times. All right? Thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest. It was a promised son. It was priceless. And he asked for something of great consequence. Offer him there for a burnt offering. Lord, would it have been something else? Abraham was a rich man. He was kicked out of countries. He was so rich. Lord, I'll give you all my cattle. I don't care about being rich anymore. But, but Isaac, my son, whom I love, the son of promise, then the natural, the natural, not spiritual, but natural response. The way God asked it, it was asked for a one-time gift. A burnt offering is not something you offer two times. Just one time. You only offer once for a burnt offering. It was unrecoverable. You see, I'd say this, that God's request at first seemed difficult, seemed unfair, and seemed unjust. My question this morning, as we start to close, is what is your response when God's requests seem difficult, seem unfair, and seem unjust? Notice I didn't say it was difficult, it was unfair, and was unjust, because it wasn't. We know the end. But Abraham didn't know that when he started, did he? He only had this request from God. A rich businessman and an attorney were traveling around the world. They saw many impressive sights, but agreed that something they saw in Korea was the most impressive of all. One morning as they walked along a country road in Korea... They saw a boy pulling a plow which was steered by an old man. It amused the attorney so much that he insisted on taking a picture of the scene with his little pocket camera. Later, he showed the picture to a missionary in the next village, remarking about the spectacle. Yes, said the missionary, it does seem like a very strange way to plow a field, but I happen to know the boy and the old man well. They are very poor. However, when the little church was built here in the village. They wanted to contribute something. They had no money. They had not grain to spare, and winter was coming on. So they sold their ox, and they gave the money to the church building fund. And now, minus the valuable animal, they have to pull the plow themselves. The men looked at each other for a moment, then the attorney said, but what a stupendous sacrifice. Why did you allow it? Mr. responded, well, they did not feel that way about it at all. In fact, they regarded it as a great joy that they had Knox to give to the Lord's work. See, sometimes God may ask a request. Seems difficult, seems unfair, seems unjust. But I love the response of Abraham, and we'll close with this. In verse number three, and Abraham rose up early in the morning. Of all the days to miss your alarm, of all the days to delay, of all the days to have one more meal and one more walk and one more talk, that would have been the day, but not Abraham. You see that? God spoke to him and he obeyed. God speaks to you and to me. Do we have the same response that Abraham had? He didn't grow up in a Christian home. He grew up with a bunch of pagans. But he started to believe on God. The God of the universe, his faith was so strong, his belief in God, I believe God so strong that when God spoke, he obeyed. Just like that. Lord, I thank you for your word. For Abraham. Lord, I ask that you would help us to have the same response of Abraham. We may not understand what you ask us and why you ask us these things, Lord. Lord, may we by faith follow you. May we not delay. Lord, may we not try to rationalize in our human thinking, but trust you. What if you're here this morning, and I wonder if God spoke to your heart this morning. Maybe God has asked something of you that seems to be hard, seems to be difficult or unfair or unjust. And really what you need to do is just obey, like Abraham. I wonder if there's somebody here this morning that said, Pastor, as you spoke, God spoke to me this morning. Would you pray for me that, 
that I will obey God the way that he spoke to me this morning. Maybe something I mentioned, something I didn't, but you say, Pastor, would you pray for me? God spoke to me this morning. Would you pray for me when you pray in a moment? Flip your hand up, slip back down. I'll see you. Amen. Amen. I see that. Amen. 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 I wonder if there's someone here who, if you died today, you don't know that you'd go to heaven. You've never asked Jesus to save you from your sins. Maybe you know about God, know about Jesus, but you've never trusted him. And we'd love to open a Bible and show you today. Love to pray for you right now. What if you'd say, Pastor Howell, if I died now, I don't know, then I'd go to heaven. Would you pray for me when you pray for the others? I'd like to know that. Slip it up, slip back down, and I'll see your hand. Amen. I see that hand. Amen. And Lord, you've seen these hands. Lord, you know our hearts. You know the struggles that we have sometimes. But Lord, thank you for the example of Abraham and really, Lord, your strength. You've never failed us. Lord, bless this invitation. Those who raise their hand acknowledge that they've been touched by you, that you would help them to respond the right way. And those who, Lord, want to know more about you and your son Jesus, would they respond by faith in Jesus' name.